good morning, Neighborhood Church. You are awake. That is awesome. My name's Jordan. I'm part of the team here. And first of all, I just want to let you know that I am very, very excited for Thanksgiving this week. Who's excited for Thanksgiving this week? A few of you, yes. It's that wonderful time of year where we take a few days off of work, kids are out of school, we gather together with our closest friends and family, and we stuff ourselves silly with turkey and mashed potatoes. Personally, I'm a big fan of the turkey nap. You guys familiar with the turkey nap? It's where you binge eat turkey and gravy until you kind of slip into a coma in the afternoon. It's quite glorious. Now, before we move on, I, I wanted to do a bit of a Thanksgiving survey today. I want to see where you guys are all at. Um, where are my turkey and gravy people at this morning? Okay, okay. A lot of turkey people. Mashed potato crew, where are you at? There we go. Stuffing? Yeah. <laughs> Those are the wild ones. Watch out for the stuffing people. How about cranberry sauce? All right, you guys are weird. Uh, green bean casserole people, anyone? Yeah, very nice. Pie people, where are you at? And if you like your pumpkin pie or your pecan pie, a la mode with a side of ice cream, let me hear a big amen this morning. Blessings upon thee. <laughs> Last thing, let's get interactive. Uh, does anyone have any like weird Thanksgiving traditions as far as food? Who eats something different, non-traditional? Just shout it out. I want to hear it. Prime rib. Prime rib. Dang. Living in the life of luxury over there. <laughs> Coming over to your house. Who else does something weird food-wise? What was that? Polenta. Okay, I, th I thought you said something else. Polenta. Anyone else? Somebody said tri-tip in the first service. Any tri-tip peeps? Very cool. Going once, going twice. Does anyone have Mexican food for Thanksgiving? Tamales? Yes, okay. I'm not going to the prime rib house. I'm going to the tamale house. I'll see you guys this week. Thank you. Just set the table for me. Hey, Thanksgiving is coming. We are super excited. And before we jump into our teaching time today, I wanted to hit a few quick commercials for you. First of all, I'm super excited. We're doing our next NC Lab here in a few weeks. These are uh, monthly environments we've created that are highly interactive, they're discussion-based, and it's really just a simple time where we come together to discuss different topics that we think are important. This month, we're doing a lab called Losing Faith, Why It Happens and What to Do About It. How many of you know the last few years have been very difficult? And when you add that on top of our own personal dramas and, and baggage from the challenges of our lives, sometimes our faith gets a little shaky starts to crumble a little bit. And here's the thing, that's not something we need to be ashamed of or hide from. We think that doubt is actually a really normal part of our faith journey. It's something we should feel free to acknowledge and talk about. And that's exactly what we're going to do at our next NC Lab. So if you or someone you know might benefit from that conversation, sign up for our NC Lab outside the next lounge after service. It's going to be Tuesday, November 30th, 6.30 to 8, right here. Again, these are really just down-to-earth, safe environments where we can connect with each other. And we've invited this good-looking guy, Joshua Ryan Butler. He's going to come out to host the lab. He's a really super smart pastor, author, blogger, Christian thinker that we really respect. And he's going to walk us through some different reasons why we lose our faith. So if that sounds good, make sure to get signed up today at the next lunch. Now, also, I wanted to recap last week. We had a ton of fun. Last Sunday, we threw a big Friendsgiving party in our parking lot with lots of pie, and we had all of our community partners with us. These are nonprofit organizations that are working hard to make people's lives in Visalia better. At Neighborhood, we say that we are for Visalia, which means that we like to partner up with the people who are making a huge difference in our city. We believe following Jesus means caring about the things he cares about, loving our neighbors, taking care of the poor, and making our city a better place for everyone who lives in it. So last week, we had all our partners here so you could meet them and get to know them and sign up to volunteer. But also, you donated your money 
to support the work of these partners. And I just wanted to let you know, if you missed out last week, you still have an opportunity. Today is the last day you can support our community partners with a gift of $39.95 or more by heading to ncvicelia.com, texting the info you see there, and just selecting Friendsgiving. You can also drop off a gift in the drop boxes in the back. Just write uh, Friendsgiving on those. And those dollars will go directly to the work of our community partners who are helping people in need in our city. Neighborhood, just thank you in advance and again for your generosity, for loving and leading within our community. Every one of those dollars, all the hours you volunteer, all of that is sharing the love of Jesus in our community. So thank you again. All that said, today we are wrapping up our teaching series we've been calling Friendsgiving. And really throughout this series this month, we've been talking about the idea of gratitude. In this day and age where cynicism is normalized and division and polarization are just kind of wreaking havoc in our society, gratitude is a sweet, sweet breath of fresh air. In this day and age, gratitude is countercultural. It's radical. It's really a choice, an attitude a posture, a discipline, and really gratitude sits at the heart of our faith in Jesus. The author Melody Beatty once wrote, gratitude turns what we have into enough and more. It turns denial into acceptance, chaos into order, confusion into clarity. It makes sense of our past, brings peace for today, and creates a vision for tomorrow. Gratitude is powerful. And Forrest echoed this a few weeks ago in his message titled, Enough is Enough, where we explored how gratitude leads to a place of contentment. Gratitude leads us to a place where we're not always anxiously comparing our lives and our possessions and our accomplishments to other people. We're not exhausting ourselves in this never-ending quest for bigger, better, greater stuff, and so on. Now, I think it's appropriate for us to be talking about gratitude this month, because again, as I mentioned, Thanksgiving is this week. Um, It's really crazy, but we have this whole holiday surrounding the idea that we should be thankful. In a culture that constantly says more, 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 bigger, better, greater, faster, we take time off of work, we pull our kids out of school, and we give thanks by gathering together with our loved ones. Super fun, right? Right? Well, I guess I preface that on it depends on your loved ones and your family. Because for some of you, Thanksgiving is more of a reminder of how dysfunctional your extended family is. Can anyone relate? Actually, don't put your hands up for that one. (laughs) That was a rhetorical question. Some of you out there are probably dreading Thanksgiving this week because you know you'll be getting together and you can already see it. That one liberal cousin and that conservative uncle are going to be holding the meal hostage, debating about masks and vaccines and what's going on in the political sphere. You know, maybe your aunt is going to come with her drunk boyfriend again this year. Grandma's having an emotional breakdown in the kitchen and people are fighting in the lawn. I guess what I'm trying to say is For some of you, your Thanksgiving is going to look like a Norman Rockwell painting, while some of your Thanksgiving is going to look like an episode of Jerry Springer. But at the end of the day, family woes aside, Thanksgiving is really supposed to be a holiday about gratitude. Now, if you study gratitude, you'll find that experts in a variety of fields agree on one thing. Gratitude makes life better. Gratitude makes your life better. It makes relationships better. It makes our mental health better. It makes just about everything we experience in life, the good, but also the bad, and even the ugly. Gratitude makes life better. Listen to some of the research I did this week on gratitude. Here's what psychologists are saying. Gratitude is both a temporary feeling and a uh, dispositional trait. In both cases, gratitude involves a process of recognizing there is an external source for that good outcome. That's interesting, right? Gratitude actually forces us to go beyond ourselves, to get out of our heads. And that's always a super healthy thing. Psychologists find that over time, feeling grateful boosts happiness and fosters both physical and psychological health. 
even among those already struggling with mental health problems. So gratitude not only can prevent issues, but gratitude is a way to pull us out of our issues as well, to move past them. People who are grateful feel less pain, less stress, suffer insomnia less, have stronger immune systems, experience healthier relationships, and do better academically and professionally. Overall, it can boost your mental health and your physical health. That's quite the glowing review for gratitude. I mean, who wouldn't want these benefits? Experts agree, gratitude makes your life better. And ironically, those moments when we feel the least grateful, when we're feeling the most miserable, those are the times we should be practicing thankfulness because it is scientifically proven to pull us out of our funk. Now, this morning, we're not just going to have a psychological conversation. Um, This is actually a conversation that sits at the very center of our faith in Jesus. Why? Well, because gratitude is actually the vehicle for our worship. Gratitude is the vehicle for our worship. Today, I want us to see how gratitude and worship are inextricably linked together. Now, most people would agree that worship is a major part of the Christian faith, right? But what is worship? Is it singing? Is it music? Is it what we do here on a Sunday morning in this room? Is it some sort of religious ritual? Is it, is it prayer? Is it listening to K-Love in the car when you're driving to work? These are great questions. And yes, worship does have many different forms and functions for a person of faith. But today I want to zoom out and look at the big picture. Worship at its core, is an expression of gratitude. Worship is how we express love, devotion, admiration, appreciation, and reverence towards our amazing God. And all of that comes from a place of gratitude. We worship because we're grateful for who God is and what he's done. We worship because we're grateful for his never-ending love mercy, and grace. We worship because we're grateful that God is the source of everything beautiful and wonderful that we love on this planet. We worship because we're grateful that he sent Jesus to lead us and love us and transform us and invite us into an entire new way of being. We worship because we're grateful that that hope can never be taken away from us. We worship because we're grateful that death isn't the end of our story, new life has invaded our lives, and we can experience God's kingdom right here and right now. Our worship is a continual expression of gratitude towards God. And there are so many ways for us to express that gratitude. Yes, singing, but also praying, journaling, serving, following Jesus. It can be artistic expression. It can even be when you're hiking in nature and just soaking in God's beautiful creation. Even that's an act of worship. Take Sundays, for example, like what we're doing right now. When we gather together and sing on a Sunday morning, it's not a concert. (laughs) It's actually a big thank you to God. We're not sitting out here just watching Nate, Megan, and the team entertain us with top 40 Christian hits. We're actually participating as a community to tell God how grateful we are for who he is and what he's done. I grew up in the church, and I used to be weirded out by worship. Part of me thinks that maybe that's because it was a really charismatic church, and people had tambourines and ribbons, and they were running all over the place. But even still, even in an environment like this, it can be confusing. When I was younger, I used to ask questions like, why are we singing? Why do we have to stand the whole time? Why is that guy raising his hands? What does that mean? That's weird. Why does it seem like other people are feeling some sort of thing inside and I don't feel anything whatsoever? I just feel tired and hungry. Why do we worship? What's it all about? These are the questions I would ask. And as I got older, I realized that when we worship together, it's not, you know, about a tingle up your spine or getting goosebumps up your arms when the chorus hits. Sure, worship can be emotional. It's absolutely a time for emotional connection. But that doesn't mean it has to be this weird religious ritual. 
at the end of the day, what we do when we worship together, we're really just expressing our gratitude towards God. Now today, I want us to examine a story from the life of Jesus. This story comes from Luke's biography of Jesus, also known as Luke's gospel. Luke was a part of the early Christian church. He was a physician, he was an educated man, and he was absolutely fascinated by the life of Jesus. So much so that he spent a lot of time and energy and resources researching and compiling this biography of Jesus that takes up a big chunk of your New Testament in your Bible. We read in Luke's gospel that Jesus is traveling with his disciples. He's performing miracles. He's teaching about God's kingdom. He's healing the sick. And he's just being that all-around awesome guy that Jesus is. It's in this context that we read the following story. Now, on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. Now, let me give you some medical context. Leprosy was an incredibly painful, incredibly infectious disease that would absolutely ravage the bodies of its victims. Lepers were covered in rashes and open sores, and, and these infections would literally rot away their skin and their limbs and even their eyes as well. Now today, the disease is mostly preventable. Even in poorer countries, um, the symptoms can be managed and mitigated through modern medicine. But in the first century, when Jesus lived, leprosy was absolutely horrific. It was also highly contagious. So lepers were shunned from society. They were outcasts. The Jewish people considered them to be religiously unclean. Nobody wanted to be around a leper. And actually, legally, the lepers were not allowed to come around people. It was bad enough that these poor souls were, were suffering from this painful, debilitating disease. But on top of that, in ancient culture, they believed if you were a leper, it was your fault. It was some sort of divine punishment that you, the victim, must have done something wrong or evil to deserve the disease that you had, which honestly, that is just heartbreaking to imagine. I can't believe what it must have been like to be a leper in that day and time. So these lepers would be rounded up and kicked out of the cities, ostracized and isolated out in the countryside in a leper colony. It was like an extreme form of, of quarantining or, or social distancing, you know, as we've become familiar with that language lately. But here in this story, we meet these 10 lepers who somehow, even from their isolation, had heard about Jesus. This Jesus who's been going around healing the sick, and raising the dead. Try and place yourself in the shoes of those lepers. Can you imagine what that must have been like? Can you imagine being utterly hopeless, left to slowly rot in agony and isolation, and then one day you find out there might be a cure? One day you find out there might be an opportunity to turn your situation around? I don't know how far these lepers traveled, Luke doesn't say, but I would imagine they would have gone any distance to meet Jesus that day. They would have braved any danger. They would have done anything just for a glimmer of hope that maybe, just maybe, this Jesus could heal them and turn their lives around forever. We read in the story that they cry out from a distance, and Jesus answers. Here's what we read. When he saw them, he said, go. Show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Just like that, boom, healed. It's just as simple as that with the word from Jesus. The lepers are healed. There's no more pain. There's no more agony. There's no more sickness. After years of suffering, they're free. It's an absolute miracle. And it's significant on multiple levels because it's not just physical restoration of this painful disease, it's also relational restoration as well. Did you notice that Jesus instructs them to go show themselves to the priests? Why did he tell them to do that? 
Jesus sends them to the priests so they can see that they've been healed, so they can see that they are no longer unclean, that these lepers can now come back home. They can rejoin the community. They can experience relationships once again. In the course of one day, Jesus has changed these 10 lives forever. They have been physically and relationally healed. Let's read what happens next. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. One of these lepers comes back running, comes back to express his gratitude through worship, falling at the feet of Jesus, thanking him. Worship, as we see, is an expression of gratitude. And this is also interesting because it's a Samaritan. It's not a Jew. I don't know if you know this, but Samaritans and Jews were enemies in the first century. Yet the Samaritan was so grateful, he fell down and worshiped at the feet of a Jewish rabbi named Jesus. His gratitude was so real, so profound, so vibrant, that it crossed cultural and religious boundaries. It was a transcendent sense of gratitude being expressed through genuine worship. But where are the other guys? Wasn't there 10? That's exactly what Jesus says. Jesus asked, were not all 10 cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Jesus gave these 10 lepers the most beautiful, profound gift they could have ever received. The gift of healing, the gift of restoration, the gift of a, a future, really. And yet they're nowhere to be found. Shouldn't they be grateful? Shouldn't they be worshiping too? Jesus is perplexed. I mean, maybe they are grateful, but here's the thing. Unexpressed gratitude might as well be ingratitude. There's a quote from the musician and thinker Robert Braille who once wrote, there's no such thing as gratitude unexpressed. If it is unexpressed, it is plain, old-fashioned ingratitude. Let me ask you, have you ever opened the door for someone and they just blew right past you, didn't say anything? Have you ever taken someone out for lunch, paid for their meal, they walk off, not a word of thanks? Maybe you got a a gift for a friend or, or family member, not a peep. Feels bad, right? It's frustrating. It's offensive. That's because unexpressed gratitude is ingratitude. And that's what we see from the other nine lepers in this story. I mean, did they just get caught up in celebrating? Did they get lost? They didn't know where Jesus was or or how to find them? We don't actually know. For all we know, they could have been extremely grateful. But their silence led Jesus to assume the opposite. And you know what makes it worse is that these other nine lepers were fellow Jews. They were technically God's people. Shouldn't the people who know God and claim to be his children be leading the way and expressing gratitude? Apparently not in this story. It's true then, and unfortunately, it's still true today. God's people, the ones who know him the most, who have experienced his love and grace the most deeply, sometimes do the lousiest job of expressing gratitude. Instead of worship, many times there's silence, or even worse, entitlement and whining. Unexpressed gratitude is the same as ingratitude. I found this um, spicy quote this week uh, from a 20th century author and essayist named William George Jordan. And he said it this way. He was very blunt. Pulling no punches. He said, ingratitude is a crime more despicable than revenge, which only returns evil for evil, while ingratitude returns evil for good. Worship, though, is an expression of gratitude. And as I mentioned earlier, it goes beyond singing on a Sunday morning in church. Here's something you need to know. Here's the one thing I want you to remember from this morning. Forget the Jerry Springer reference. Forget the turkey talk. This is the main point today. Worship 
is a lifestyle of gratitude. Worship doesn't just take place on Sunday mornings. It happens every day, everywhere we go. Our attitude, our decisions, our actions, they should all be an expression of worship, an overflowing of gratitude from our hearts into our lives. It's not just singing. Really, anything we do that expresses gratitude to God is an act of worship. The early church father, Augustine, once said, don't let your life give evidence against your tongue. Sing with your voices. Sing also with your conduct. In other words, Augustine was saying, don't just talk the talk, walk the walk. That's what real worship looks like. It's not just singing songs. It's living a lifestyle of gratitude. So we worship God by living like Jesus, and we worship God by loving our neighbors, and we worship God by choosing his ways as our ways. We worship God by adopting a posture of trust and obedience and devotion to God. You know, for example, last week, we gathered together and we sacrificed our hard-earned dollars to make our city a better place for everyone. That's an act of worship. Or a few weeks ago, we opened the doors of our campus. We had thousands of people here for S'more Visalia because we want to show Visalia we love them, we are for them, we want to practice hospitality. That's an act of worship. And listen, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with what we do here singing on Sundays. I love it. It's fantastic. It's beautiful. I think we all need this weekly rhythm in our lives. But hear me, what we do on a Sunday morning is really just the tip of the iceberg. Listen, if we just relegate our worship to Sunday mornings only, it's not really worship anymore. It's, it's more of a weekly obligation. It's a box to check. It's a routine, a, a ritual, an obligation. Our Sunday mornings are really designed not to be the be-all, end-all of your faith. They're a starting point. These gatherings are a catalyst that hopefully launch you into a week of worship with your hearts, minds, your decisions, actions, relationship, all of it. I think as Jesus people, our worship shouldn't be compartmentalized. It should really be centralized to our lives. What does that mean? That means worship isn't just something we do. It's a part of who we are. The Apostle Paul, an early Christian leader, wrote it this way in his letter to the Romans. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. In ancient Israel, I don't know if you knew this, but they would worship by sacrificing on an altar. I don't know if you've noticed, we don't have an altar in here. We're not asking you to bring goats and lambs and pigeons and doves to, to sacrifice to God during service. And thank God, because one, that would make me feel sick. Two, it would probably make me cry. And three, PETA would be kicking down the doors to shut us down. We don't worship through sacrifice anymore. Instead, Paul says our lives should be the sacrifice. Because of what Jesus has done for us, we've been invited to become a living sacrifice, a walking, talking expression of gratitude for God's never-ending love. Our worship is no longer something we, we do. It becomes who we are. One worship leader and songwriter I've, I've come to appreciate over the years is named Matt Redman. And one time he said this, in the end, worship can never be a performance, something you're pretending or putting on. It's got to be an overflow of your heart. When our hearts are filled with gratitude, we can't help but worship. This means you can worship on a mountaintop and you can worship in a hospital bed. Good, bad, ugly, good times, bad times, all of it. Every moment and season is an opportunity to express gratitude through your worship. And that gratitude brings us closer to God. That gratitude makes our lives better. It makes us better. Worship is really an expression and a lifestyle of gratitude. I want to wrap up today by telling you a story. Um, 
You may not know this, but for many years, I was a teenager, and, and throughout my 20s, I was a worship leader. Uh, I've wor led worship at, at churches big, small, and just about everything in between. I've led worship for a few dozen people at a time. I've, I've led worship for a few thousand people at a time. And not only that, but because I grew up in kind of the church world, I've had the opportunities to go to all sorts of large worship events. You know, I've, I've been in stadiums singing to God uh, alongside tens of thousands of people all over the world. We're talking these like multi-million dollar worship events with all the bells and whistles and, and lights and video and, and all the stuff that rivals like a, you know, Madonna concert or something. Madonna, really? That's such a dated reference. Lady Gaga concert. <laughs> I'm turning into a boomer before your guys' eyes. So I've seen all the big worship names out there, been there. How great is our God? And then bought the t-shirt on the way out. I've been to these huge worship events, and it's great. I really felt like I connected with God. In fact, there were so many times that I'd be standing on a stage leading worship for maybe a few thousand people, or standing in an arena surrounded by tens of thousands of people worshiping, and I would think to myself, man, now this is worship. This is what worship looks like. Now, fast forward a few years. I went on a trip to a small country in South Africa. I was 24 years old, and I was a photographer traveling with a group of missionaries. And as you can imagine, like most young people on their first like mission trip style experience, there was a lot of culture shock. My eyes were open to a lot of new realities. My perspective was broadened. There was a lot I learned on that trip, and I'll never, ever forget the worship. One Sunday, I was sitting in a church about the size of our cafe in the lobby. The walls were just bare concrete, and it was filled with like those plastic lawn chairs from the 90s. That morning, I experienced worship like I never had before. Packed stadiums, million-dollar technology, all this. It had nothing on this tiny little humble service. As we gathered together in this ramshackle, sweaty, hot, uncomfortable space, the emotion and the energy were absolutely palpable. That morning, I, a complete stranger got to lock arms with new friends. We prayed together. We sang together. We worshiped. And I realized that I was amongst friends whose lives looked completely different than my own. They had no wealth. They didn't live in a powerful nation like America. Uh, their houses were smaller than most of our garden sheds and our backyards. Compared to the, even the most modest middle-class American lifestyle, these people were utterly destitute. And yet their joy was overwhelming. The sincerity and authenticity of their worship was unreal. The room was filled with more gratitude and love for God than I think I had ever experienced in any church service back home. I started feeling emotional. I actually started crying a little bit because I realized in that moment how ungrateful of a lifestyle I had been living. I realized how much that I take for granted each and every day. I realized how much I view worship as spiritual entertainment or a Christian product to be consumed rather than as an expression of deep, deep thankfulness for God. I've seen multi-million dollar church campuses filled with people who look utterly miserable, like they would rather be anywhere else. And then I've been in mud huts filled with the poorest of the poor, expressing more praise and joy than I've ever seen in my life. And it's not just hype. It's not just a performance. My new friends, they weren't just talking the talk. They were walking the walk. They loved their neighbors. They cared, cared for each other. That week, I met victims of violence who had forgiven their assailants. I met people who had suffered under political uh, oppression from corrupt regimes, and they had forgiven their enemies. I met women who were literally living in a mud hut who had adopted eight AIDS orphans off the streets into their family. They had nothing to give but love, and they did it freely and graciously. Why did they live their lives like this? Well, I think it's because they lived lifestyles of worship, of gratitude expressed through action. And I thought to myself, wow, I've got a lot of catching up to do. Wow, we've got a lot of catching up to do. Now, 
I already know what some of you are thinking. Here we go. Here's this bleeding heart millennial telling us his sad mission trip story to make us all feel bad. It's really not what I'm doing this morning. It's not a guilt thing. It's not a shame thing. It's more of an inspiration thing. It's not about the stuff or lack of stuff. It's about the heart behind it. I'm not saying that we should shut down our campus and go in Frank's backyard and have lawn chairs and be in the garage. That's not what it's about. I think sometimes, especially we young Christians, we tend to glamorize poverty. We tend to think it's inherently more spiritual. It's really not. It's not about the stuff. It's about the heart behind the stuff. My friends in Africa, they were amazing worshipers, not because of their poverty. It was because of their attitude. It was because of their gratitude. They were great worshipers because they possessed a genuine sense of thankfulness that transcended their situation. And that's really the same for us, rich, poor, wherever you are on the wealth spectrum. We can all tap into joy through gratitude. Gratitude is an attitude that takes us to a place of joy, no matter what difficulties we face. And this morning, we want you to experience that before you leave. I'm actually going to invite the worship team back up this morning, and we're going to take communion together. And this feels appropriate, right? It's Thanksgiving week. We're wrapping up this series about gratitude And we're going to have an opportunity this morning to express our worship in this ancient, beautiful, sacred practice of communion. On the way in, you should have received your cute little communion cup from our ushers. If you did not, just put your hand in the air, flag them down, and they will hook you up. Now, as a reminder, communion is a practice we embrace together as a way of remembering everything Jesus has done for us. The wine or juice in this case is a symbol of his blood poured out as a ransom for many, a sacrifice of love and forgiveness for all who would embrace him. The bread, or in our case, the barely edible wafer, is a symbol of his body broken for us. Jesus defeated sin, death, Darkness and evil, not through power, not through force, but through selfless love and forgiveness. So this is what we remember as we share communion together. So in a moment, the worship team is going to show up behind me. They're going to play one more song today. And while that happens, we want you to take the communion elements, gather up with friends, family, strangers, whoever, maybe by yourself, whatever you want to do, pray Take the communion elements, and let's sing one more song together this morning. There's no rules here. If you want to stand, stand. If you want to sit, sit. If you need someone to take communion with, our our prayer partners are right here, prayer team. Let's take a pause in our busy, crazy lifestyles this fall before we head into the holiday season and just take a moment to express gratitude through communion. Because neighborhood, we have a lot to be grateful for, don't we? There's a lot to be grateful for, and so let's express that gratitude through worship. Let me pray for us, and we'll get started. Lord, thank you for who you are and what you've done for us. Thank you that you love us, even though most of the time we don't deserve it, and we take that love for granted. So often we can be like those nine lepers who just take from you and and run off without expressing that gratitude through worship, not just in song, but in our lifestyles. God, would you just remind us through your spirit that each day is an opportunity to express gratitude through worship, through a lifestyle that is centered on Jesus. And that's not something we can just do when we're in a good mood or when we feel like it. Really, that's the key to joy, even in the lowest moments. So Father, I pray for every single person in this room today. You see their situation. You see what they're going through. As we take communion this morning, would you make your presence very real in their lives? Father, we love you. We're grateful for you.